Let me have your attention. Let's have a warm loyal welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for this uh, uh, invitation. It's an honor and a privilege for me to, to speak to this uh, distinguished economics club. And uh, I've been, uh, especially I, am still very grateful for the great hospitality with which I've been received here at the department. Uh, special thanks to Professor Stuart Wood for this hearty welcome this morning. He knocked on my uh, office door like the German police. <laughs> so I immediately fell home. <laughs> This big voice and blah blah blah. We know that you're in there. <laughs> At first, I did not pay my income tax. <laughs> well, my topic uh, today is uh, the ethics of money production, and in fact, I have hope that uh, when we uh, fix the subject um, of my talk, I hope that the book would be ready by now. So it would have been a nice sales uh, <laughs> uh, venture. But as you see, well, I'm here without book there. There's just this very nice uh, poster someone has created. This is not how the, um, the front page of the book looks like. So there's no paper on the, on the front page. We have decent, decent money on the, on the, on the front page. Um, uh, so the book is not yet in here. Now, we'll, what I will do now in uh, the next uh, 50 minutes or so is to give you a general introduction to what the book is all about, what the argument is, what the structure of the book is. So the general idea is to uh, present the principles of money and banking combined with a discussion of the ethical and also spiritual implications that result from uh, monetary institutions. Uh, the book has originally been written for a Catholic audience, and has been uh, generalized uh, for you know, a Christian audience because uh, I felt that uh, these uh, groups of people in particular need to know much more uh, about money, uh, the political, uh, cultural, social implications that go in hand with monetary choice. Monetary policy is, I think, not a matter that should be left uh, in the hands of our monetary authorities, that is, particular uh, central bankers, but it is, needs to be uh, situated at a, at a much more general level. Monetary policy does not start when Bernanke closes the meetings of the Federal Reserve Committee. <coughs> But it starts at the moment when we decide which kind of uh, monetary system we want to have or whether we want to have a Federal Reserve. Uh, because that's, that's a political choice to make. And Congress can just abrogate any privileges that have been accorded to uh, the Federal Reserve. And in principle, that's a decision that can be taken from uh, now uh, until next morning. So very quickly change our monetary constitution. And that's, uh, therefore, the, the level on which I perceive that uh, the policy debate should take place. Um, the particularity of the book is, therefore, about well, to uh, present principles of money and banking in uh, accessible terms without too much uh, technical jingo. An application of uh, bringing together, in more, more particularly, three elements uh, that are not usually combined in uh, monetary uh, economics textbooks. Uh, one is the application of philosophical <laughs> realism to money and banking. Now, most textbooks uh, written today, not only in the field of money and banking, but in economics more generally, are based, philosophically speaking, on a doctrine that is called positivism. And for positivists, the only kind of evidence that counts is the evidence of the senses. Okay, it's only what you can see, feel, uh, touch, hear, is uh, the evidence that is allowed, and the argument is always constructed around uh, this uh, uh, type of facts, and therefore you have, for example, econometric, econometric, uh, econometrics classes, right? econometric exercises, and so on. Now, in philosophical realism, we have a larger view of uh, the facts that count for a science, and the facts that, that therefore also count for uh, as a basis for political decision making. And we here need to talk in particular about human choice, about the determinants of human choice the institutional setting in which human choice takes place. So that's <coughs> what I'm doing in this book. And what before me has, of course, been done by, well, great many uh, economists, and in our day, by the Austrian economists in particular. So there are different schools of economics, and here, you at uh, Loyola University are privileged with being exposed to a very strong presence of the Austrian school. So almost I would have to talk to you more about what positivist economists are doing rather than what the Austrian economists are doing. Uh, 
because you have the faculty, uh, Professor Wood and Bill Barnett and uh, Walter Block, and we hope very soon also John and Van Der his piece with Austrian business cycle theory. So the Austrian school has been the um, uh, carrier of this tradition of uh, philosophical realism within economics for more than 120 years. Before the Austrians, that was in fact standard among economists. Right? The, uh, the age of the classical economists, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, nobody to say, and others, uh, that was more or less taken for granted. They had, if they had to the extent that they had any, any uh, philosophical opinion at all, it was by and large philosophical realism, which was the standard philosophy that you apply in those days. So nowadays, only the Austrians have been left, and all others have uh, looked for a different orientation. The third element is then uh, ethics in the tradition of the medieval scholastics, and in particular, in the tradition of the uh, a school of thought that we call the school of Salamanca, the school of late uh, scholastics. Salamanca is a town in Spain which hosts a very old university and which was home to this uh, group of thinkers, predominantly uh, Dominicans, Jesuits, who in the 16th and 17th century set out to uh, analyze the new economic institutions that sprang up in their time in order to evaluate their uh, moral and spiritual dimension. Why was that? Well, they were theologians, they were priests in particular, so their main interest was a very practical one. They had to write the manuals that were sent to the priest for the confessional. Right? So the priest, well, he heard the confession from various businessmen or traders and so on, and well, he had to know what they were talking about and whether that was what they were doing was a sin or whether that was a right. So in order to know whether it was a sin or whether it was a right, well, you had to know something about the, the subject matter. First lesson, so we don't apply uh, abstract principles that come out of nowhere and then just impose them on any kind of activity. We look first very carefully on the activity and then in the light of this, light of our understanding, we can then uh, sense whether uh, and where are the moral and spiritual issues. So that's, that's what they did. And uh, in, the, in this process, they developed a rather sophisticated analysis of uh, some of the monetary institutions that we still have in our day in particular banking, and here in particular fractional reserve banking, um, of which I'm sure Walter Block has told you a few times. Now, the central thesis in, in, in my book is that there are just and unjust monetary systems. And the criterion by which we can distinguish just and unjust monetary system is by looking at how money is being produced. Okay, now that's maybe a somewhat unusual perspective because for economists in particular, when we talk about money, particularly in the context of Keynesian macroeconomics, money is always an exogenous variable. Right? We always write with a stern voice an expression on our face, we write on the blackboard MS. And this line signifies that it's an exogenous variable. It's just taken for granted, it comes from outer space. In this case, from the government. So it's just not a matter of production, it's just a decision. It's a pure matter of volition on the side of the authorities. Now, in order to understand the moral issues that are at stake in money banking, we need to go one step back and then uh, try to understand uh, the way money is being produced today within a more general theory of money production. That's what I'm doing. Money production is an industry like any other industry, and it is almost a miracle that so far nobody has taken a closer look at these from, from the moral point of view. Right? People are examining trade and whether trade is fair or not. Uh, there is other pharmaceutical industry, are they living uh, the animal experiments and, and so on. So virtually to any industry of some significance we apply today moral standards, there's some moral or ethical assessment, there's a, there are professionals in the field or the entire streams of literature dealing with particular industries and so on. Only 
with the case in the case of money and banking, that seems to be absent. Money and banking do not seem to warrant moral examination, and uh, I think that's wrong. The subject has been neglected by most people who should have uh, had an interest, uh, should have had an interest in looking closer at it. Uh, in particular, by the church, by professional economists. Exceptions have been very few. I'll mention a few of them later on. So the church has, has uh, neglected, in particular the Catholic Church, has neglected money and banking. And um, although we might uh, regret this, there are, there's also a very good side to it. So what we find in church documents and the encyclicals in particular are rather vague statements. As for example, uh, stable money is a condition for fruitful working of the economy. And things like that. So it's exceedingly vague. So it's never a definition what stability means, uh, and never any explicit reference to any particular type of monetary theory. Now that's probably good so, right? because if the, the problem of what we call Catholic social doctrine is now that it applies generally valid principles of morals and faith to particular historical, uh, particular institutional settings and so on, and this application cannot be done without the help of certain positive theories. Now, positive theories are fallible. Right? Pope might be in infallible as far as faith and morals is concerned, but he's not infallible as far as economics is concerned. So necessarily, any such enterprise of applying general principles to a specific context has, <coughs> has to rely on a, on a positive theory on economics, sociology, and so on, and there things can go badly wrong. One thesis of the book is that precisely uh, those who have, the few authors that have been written, uh, that have written on these issues within the Catholic Church, have mm -hmm. gone wrong precisely because they adopted uh, uh, theories. The economists have neglected the, the subject <coughs> because they have talked, especially after Keynes, they've talked about money and thought about money and banking more or less exclusively from the point of view of policy makers, that is, from the point of view of central banks. And they've done this by using a macroeconomic approach, and it's precisely this macro approach that has not uh, enlightened us very much when it comes to the moral issues. Because if we want to talk about moral issues, we need to boil it down to individual decision making. And it doesn't help us very much if we discover that certain relationships, if they exist, between the price level and the money supply and unemployment and so on need to boil it down to individual decision making. Uh, for similar reasons, they have neglected institutions. There's virtually no interest in economic history. So all these things come into play for us. And I take due account of them in, in the book. And of course, there is no ethics in, in the usual uh, textbooks on money and banking for more or less good reasons. For more or less good reasons. Now, the, the, the Neglect of our uh, subject concerns in particular modern monetary institutions. Okay? It concerns in particular banking, central banking, and paper money. As far as old monetary institutions are concerned, coin making in particular, we have, we have a very rich uh, tradition that uh, integrates uh, positive analysis with moral evaluation. For example, the Bible is full of references to uh, moral dimensions of coin making. And one of the great, uh, uh, the first uh, economist ever, uh, a Frenchman with the name Nicolas Oresny, <coughs> so was a bishop in France, uh, who wrote a, a book uh, with the title a Treatise on the Alteration of Money, which was in fact the first treatise on an economic subject ever. Okay. And, uh, the alteration of money, that sounds somewhat weird for us today. Uh, what does this mean, alteration of money? If you print some different uh, stamp on a coin, is this an alteration of money? Yes, yeah, so it's something uh, of this sort. And uh, let's say in modern terms, we have, we have to translate the book as a treatise on inflation. Okay, Because the alteration of uh, money, uh, coins, was in this time the inflation technique. Uh, that, that lasted until roughly the 17th century. And only in the 17th century it was then replaced by other inflation techniques. Ah, inflation technique, we have another word, but I'll, I'll say more, more about this later. So Oresme has given us a rather encompassing theory of <coughs> money production, 
as far as the institutions of his time are concerned, and then the scholastic, the late scholastics of the school of Salamanca applied this, mm -hmm. developed the, uh, this approach that, had, uh, that the Oresman uh, had uh, first found uh, to the case of banking, fractional reserve banking in particular. But after this, more or less it stops. Okay, few authors in the, <coughs> the 19th century have tried to integrate uh, realist analysis of money and banking with uh, ethical assessment uh, from a Christian point of view. Now in my book, I approach the, the subject in the following way. I first talk about um, what I call the natural production of money, and I'll see more about this later, the natural production of money, which is one type of money production. And then I contrast this with inflation. Okay. In the case of natural production of money, um, it's a two mutually exclusive uh, possibilities. In the case of natural production of money, we have a production of money that is conditioned by the full respect of property rights, the full respect of, of choice of property owners. So we have a situation, we could also say competitive production of money. And fully competitive production of money, that's the natural production of money. And in the case of inflation, this uh, com competition is uh, uh, stopped or uh, infringed upon by political intervention in particular. Not only by political intervention, but by political intervention in particular. So we have at least some partial violation of property rights. And as a consequence, the production of money is larger than it would have been otherwise. And this is something larger than would have resulted in the, the case of a respect of property rights as inflation. Okay. The point of this distinction is to downplay uh, the traditional concern with variations of the money supply and variations of the price level. Right? So these are the two great definitions uh, which traditionally had to of, of inflation. Inflation can be traditionally defined as an increase of the money supply or as an increase of the price level. Two different definitions, okay. So my argument is that both uh, these things, increases of the money supply and increases of the price level, are not very important. And the money supply can increase without disturbing the operation of the market economy. The price level can increase or, or decrease without disturbing the operation of the market economy. What's really important is how money is being produced and uh, the, the impact of, of choice that, that goes in hand with a particular moral hazard. We'll talk about this later. So we have a first part, natural production of, of money, and the second part, uh, inflation. And then in the third part, I apply uh, my analysis to restate, to narrate the history of uh, uh, monetary institutions in the West from the 17th century to our time. Now, uh, in what follows, I'll just pick what seem to be the most uh, interesting or maybe the most important elements uh, of my argument uh, for a little bit more detailed presentation. So first of all, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the natural production of money, and then I'll talk about a very important subject, which are the utilitarian considerations that come into play. These utilitarian considerations are usually uh, brought up to justify government intervention in the production. And then we'll come to talk about uh, uh, inflation and inflation techniques, and in particular about the consequence on the consequences of paper money. Okay, the natural production of money. Again, the criterion is are property rights fully respected? If property rights are fully respected with monetary competition, everybody is free to choose the kind of money you would like to use. Everybody is free to choose, uh, free to, to produce some type of money that he thinks money users would like to use. Uh, and the type of uh, sorts of money that can come to be adopted on the, on the market are what we would call natural monies. Natural monies are those monies that come to be adopted in a competitive process. We cannot know a priori which monies these will be. But based on historical evidence, well, we can say, well, in the past, when there was true competition, we had precious metals. And we can also understand why this is so. Mainly because precious metals, for their physical qualities, lend themselves uh, most conveniently for the purpose of indirect exchange. Okay. 
they're very difficult to buy nicely with a cow, right? a cow uh, uh, currencies and so on, but it's very easy to do this with, with a little coin, right? uh, and so on. Now, uh, which other monies could also exist? Uh, well, so the question is, why in particular could paper money not be a, a, a national money? Well, uh, Austria, within uh, the Austrian literature, there's a very important trend that well, affirms the possibility that there could also be competitive uh, production of, of paper money. Um, and this goes back in particular to Friedrich Hayek's 1977 uh, book, The Denationalization of Money, in which Hayek called for uh, opening the market of paper money production to allow private entrepreneurs uh, sell their own their own paper money on the market. He, he thought that this would help to stabilize uh, the purchasing power of money. Now, whatever the moral merit of this idea, the hard fact is that in the entire history of which we have any record whatever, there has never been a competitive production of paper money. Never. It's not one single case in which, in which uh, somebody uh, entrepreneur came up with an idea that okay here I make up my, my paper money and uh, and he actually uh, made it circulate succeeded in making it circulate in the market <coughs> why is this so well, that's a theoretical question and uh, the standard answer from Austrian economists is that we here um, uh, encounter the following difficulty if I want to introduce a new money on the market in the case of paper money, we have the problem that this paper money has no purchasing power. Nobody can really form an opinion, can really evaluate it, because you don't know what it's worth. Let's say I, uh, so we have here a picture of a Federal Reserve banknote, but I could as well print my picture on this. This, and my banknote, I print on it, seven goose masks. <laughs> then I, I intend it to you. I'm very gracious. I offer you seven months for one year of work. It's a great offer. I won't get it again. Now you see whether there's something wrong with this. Uh, what's, what's wrong with this? Well, uh, you don't know actually what it's worth. It might be that, that it's, you get enormous riches for this right, by selling the, the seven months again, but you don't know. How could you know? If I tended you a, a check over one million dollars, or uh, 1 million euros, you would be more inclined to work from here for a year, I bet. Right? In the case of seven months, which of course I think are, are much more important and valuable than 1 million euros, you would hesitate, and the reason is that, that it has not yet got any purchasing power. It's not yet being sold on the market, so that's a great, great difficulty. Okay. Now what about paper money that is already being circulated? What about dollars that are circulating now? Couldn't they survive the competition with gold and silver if we introduce free competition now. And again, there are reasons, well, we cannot know a priori, strictly speaking, but there are very good reasons to believe that, in fact, they would be driven out of the market for the following reason, that uh, uh, gold and silver go in hand with a particular risk that is absent in the case of gold and silver, namely the risk of full value annihilation. <coughs> if gold and silver, for any period of time that came to be driven out of the market were not used anymore for whatever reason. They would lose all their purchasing power, okay, and then would confront the same problem that we just discussed, namely you could not introduce them again into the market. In the case of gold and silver and well, any commodity money, this would not be possible because there's always a non-monetary demand for these commodities. <coughs> okay, that's also the reason why they can overcome the, the difficulty that paper money cannot uh, overcome in the case of the introduction. Gold can be introduced as a, as a money because there is previously already a non-monetary use. So it has already prices, it's being exchanged on the market for other things, and people know how to evaluate it. They, at least they have a basis on which they can evaluate it. So in the case of uh, competition between uh, paper money and uh, commodity monies, paper money would have very uh, crucial competitive disadvantage. And it's therefore likely that uh, prudent money users would uh, get rid of it first and then thereby precipitate um, a snowball effect declining uh, purchasing power 
of paper money and so on, which would incite ever more people to give it up. The same considerations hold true for uh, electronic money. And same thing, it's just a different physical medium, but there too, right? I mean, in the case of paper, you have some substance, well, you could use it at least for heating, right? But maybe it doesn't have a great value, but some, some money. In the case of uh, electronic money, you just have bits and bytes. Uh, you cannot even burn them, okay? So the problem is, if anything, even greater. So conclusion then, on, on the market, on the free market, on the competitive market, we would tend to have natural monies, and these uh, natural, uh, natural <coughs> monies would tend to be precious metals. If you know paper money, there would be no electronic money. Now, what about the production of money on this market? Well, it would, uh, what would determine how much money would be produced? Well, the same criteria here comes into play as in all other markets, and it's profit, okay, relative profitability. If the production of gold and silver is more profitable than the production of hats and, and shoes, then, well, the entrepreneurs, capitalists, would invest more resources into the production of gold and silver, more into mining, uh, uh, coin stamping and so on, uh, and less money into heads and shoemaking. That's all. And as we have again, or as we've again learned uh, this afternoon in uh, Professor Block's uh, class, right? So uh, profits tend to be eradicated. Uh, it's, it's a tendency toward e equilibrium on the on the market. So in equilibrium, therefore, all different uh, productive ventures have the same uh, profit, and and this is what. Uh, limits or constraints the production of money and brings it into a balance with all other uh, goods and services, the production of all other goods and services. Okay, so having reached this point, we know that what uh, natural pro uh, production of money is, how it would look like, um, and that it can, most importantly, that it can, it can, it can work. Right? It is a workable monetary system. Our question is, uh, can it be improved? <coughs> okay. Uh, two directions in which one can answer this question. One is to say, okay, certainly there are moral issues that come into play. Uh, for example, I can bring uh, the uh, coin making into greater perfection by informing coin makers about the moral uh, uh, issues that are here at stake. Clarity, for example, honesty, permanence, and so on. It's one thing. But there is a more uh, basic interrogation here as well, maybe the question, well, okay, we have uh, uh, here production of money that is, is exclusively, uh, exclusively determined by uh, profitability. So more or less by uh, the forces of the market process that go beyond mere uh, money production. Right? If, for example, uh, some other commodity uh, came to be uh, available in greater abundance, well, resource, resources would be driven out of this and invested into, into coin making. Okay, so for reasons that have nothing to do with uh, the production of money, uh, these factors would determine the production of money as well. Right? As, by the way, is the case with all other types of production. Right? The production of shoes also depends on the production of heads, and the production of microphones, and so on. Okay? Interdependence of the various uh, ventures. Now, isn't that a problem? Right? That's, the great, that's the great question. Uh, wouldn't it be better to have um, the money supply be subject to human volition. Wouldn't it be good to have a central bank determine exactly how much, how much money is available within the economy? That's a great question. That's ultimately that's the subject of a monetary uh, textbook, right, of the treatise of money. So if I've written a treatise of money, this would have been 70% or 80% of the book. Right? Since I've written a book on money production, ethics of money production, it's just a chapter. And what I try to do in this chapter is just to uh, hint at how the general argument, uh, the general answer from an Austrian point of view to this question is. And the answer is, uh, very uh, roughly speaking, that we don't have to care, okay? <coughs> it does not matter much how much money is available in the economy. Any quantity of money that is available in the economy is equally good. Any quantity of money is sufficient. Now, there are some uh, constraints here. For example, if you have a, a, a circulation of gold coins, then for technical, technological reasons, it might be the case that you could not produce them so in a suf sufficiently small uh, uh, size uh, in order to handle them and right? try to 
fabricate a gold coin in order to buy a cup of coffee. It has to be a very, very small gold coin. So you would have uh, difficulty here. Okay, so that's a technological limitation. But under currency competition, what would happen? Well, simply people would switch to other metals. Right? They would use copper coins or silver coins. It's not a big deal. Okay. So that's the general answer that Austrians give. The quantity of money does not matter much. Therefore, the natural production of money is okay. It is finite. It is the, the, uh, the best monetary constitution that we can have. Political uh, meddling with the money supply cannot improve it. It would simply create different beneficiaries at, at the cost of uh, certain losers. Okay, now I know that that's not very satisfying as a general answer, so I go into more detail as far as certain points are concerned, the most frequently brought up arguments. What are these most frequently brought up arguments? Well, uh, first of all, uh, manipulations of the money, political manipulation of the money supply can stimulate economic growth. Second, they can prevent hoarding or counteract hoarding. Third, they can help to fight deflation. Fourth, they can help to overcome the problem of sticky prices. Fifth, they can incite investment, okay, stimulate investment financing the economy. Sixth, they can uh, help to stabilize uh, money. And uh, lastly, seventh, uh, in the case of uh, political creation of, uh, of a paper money, we don't have to cope with the cost of commodity money. Commodity money is costly. Okay, now I'll go through some of these, these points just to show you okay, how uh, these typical arguments are answered from an Austrian point of view. So first of all, growth can be uh, increase uh, economic growth by increasing the money supply. Um, well, uh, growth can certainly take place without any changes on the money supply, whatever. It can even take place if the money supply shrinks. And uh, the reason is that if we have it, all that happens is that the prices will change. Let's suppose, for example, that the economy grows at uh, 5% right, and the money <coughs> supply does not change. Well, then all that would happen simply is that prices would decrease right? and all the goods and services that now come to be produced would still be sold against the uh, available money supply only at lower prices. Okay. And some people say, well, that's good and fine, but uh, um, uh, what, uh, what happens with the entrepreneur who has already bought his factors of production and uh, uh, now is forced to sell them at the lower prices? He will no longer be profitable. Well, and then the answer is, well, that, that's true, but then he's a bad entrepreneur. <laughs> it's, it's very simple. If you were a good entrepreneur, you would have anticipated this event right, and would have already bid down the factor prices, labor in particular, in advance. And if we look at the historical record, that's exactly what we observe. Right? Some of the most, of the strongest growth phases in uh, American economic history, also in European economic history, have been uh, periods in which the price level has been declining. And this worked because when entrepreneurs anticipated the constant decline of the, uh, of the price level, the constant increase of the purchasing power of money, and in anticipation of this future event, they already bid down factor prices now. And so could go on producing profitably. Okay? So we derive that from a very important insight, and we don't have to worry about variations of the money supply, we don't have to worry ultimately about variations of the price level. It's not a big deal. Okay? That's not the problem. And uh, therefore, also, hoarding is not a big problem, okay? Of course, sometimes you have your pathological uh, persons, right, who just cling to their money and don't want to spend anything, uh, live in great misery, uh, their the children are dying, the, the mother is dying in the hospital, but they cling as like a, uh, is it a, a, a Scrooge, Scrooge, exactly, like Scrooge, <laughs> sitting on this huge heap of, uh, of metal, I'm not letting one go because he loves each one of his members. <coughs> oh, that's very charming, and uh, sometimes it can also be very offensive, but, uh, but it is never a problem for the economy as a whole. That's the, that's the answer that we get. It's a problem for this individual, or maybe for a social environment who makes him suffer and so on, but it's not a problem for the economy as a whole. So let's say you have this, this miser, this Scrooge, Right? He's drawing all the gold in the entire economy, uh, of course, by selling goods and services, in a way he also renders the services, right? Uh, draws them into his uh, uh, stock, 
uh, well, all that would happen was simply be that prices decline. And if the prices decline so much that uh, we would have to produce the coins in microscopically small units, well, then people would simply switch to another commodity, use another money. It's not a big deal. So hoarding is never a social problem. Individual, it might be an individual pathology, it's not a social problem. Uh, then the uh, deflation. Deflation is considered to be uh, problematic because uh, it incites people to postpone purchases and also because it represents a problem for uh, entrepreneurs who finance their ventures with debt. Okay, let's, let's talk about what these the two things in turn. Now, uh, certainly people are incited to postpone uh, purchases as a consequence of deflation. If I can anticipate the prices will be lower well, next month or next week, uh, next year and so on, I will hold back with certain uh, purchases that I would otherwise have made now. So let us first of all so not exaggerate this. It's not the case that uh, buying would stop altogether and people would just hold back uh, indefinitely. Uh, that's not possible as we know because human beings are working under the constraint of the stomach. Okay? <laughs> Unfortunately, we've got to eat something, we've got to crunch something, and unless you have your vegetable garden and so on, you're completely autonomous, you need to buy, I don't know, you need to buy pizza, for example. <coughs> so some buying takes place anyway, okay? Now it's true, at the margin, certain uh, buying decisions are deterred. Uh, uh, and the question is then, is this, is this bad? Of course, now for Keynesian economists, then it's terrible. As soon as there's no spending going on, I mean, they break out in tears almost. <laughs> but as we know from economics, that that's not a problem. And it's rather, if anything, it's rather good for economic growth, for, because any resource that is not invested, spent now on consumption, well, is necessarily available for saving and investment. So if anything, deflation has the tendency to in, encourage saving investment, and therefore will bring out greater economic growth in the long run. Right? So I don't say, well, that we should seek a deflation in order to encourage growth. I don't say that. I mean, it would be a value judgment. But as well as we cannot say, well, we should spend more, we should consume more, that's also a value judgment. I, I, I say the only thing that we say from an Austrian point of view is, well, if we have deflation, OK. It will entail greater incentive to save rather than to, uh, to consume. As a consequence, the economy will grow stronger in the long run. That's all. We don't say it's good or bad, that's just how it is. Next point, uh, sticky prices, and here uh, deflation too is considered to be a particular problem. Um, uh, if uh, the price level decreases, uh, we've said, okay, this can work out for the economy as a whole if entrepreneurs can bid down uh, the prices of their factors of production, in particular labor. But now the argument goes, well, that, that's uh, very nice in theory, but in practice, prices are sticky, okay? It's not possible just uh, like that to, to bid them down, so you run into a big trouble. The answer to this objection is, uh, well, first of all, it's true, right? Prices are sticky, more or less sticky, but uh, the stickiness of prices is not an independent variable, it's a dependent variable, okay? And if we now come in with uh, politics and we start to manipulate the money supply, the likely effect this, this will have on the stickiness of prices is to increase the stickiness. Okay? If uh, uh, workers in their organizations, labor unions, know well that the central bank stands ready to prevent any fall in uh, nominal wage rates, well, then of course they have not a particularly great incentive to be flexible in their negotiations with, uh, with employers. So there will be all the more animals to the system, though. We won't decrease our nominal uh, demands, and you've got to pay. Right? And then they get, their, uh, they, they get what they want. In order to prevent that this leads to mass unemployment, the Federal Reserve increases the money supply, okay? which has been precisely the event anticipated. So you see, I mean, however problematic sticky prices might be, it's not because you start meddling with the money supply that you reduce this. Okay, money, sticky prices, stickiness of prices does exist, it is a problem, okay, <laughs> but uh, political intervention in money production does not solve it, it increases and reinforces this problem. Okay, then what about monetary stability? Well, certainly the, uh, the Federal Reserve can uh, stabilize uh, 
now either the money supply or the purchasing power of money? Well, from the technical point of view, yes. <coughs> and uh, today it's, it's amazing to see that this argument played a crucial role throughout the 19th century and even until the beginning of the, of the 20th century. Right, when economists said, okay, we have gold production this year, 2% increase in the money supply, oh my goodness, uh, the money will soon lose all its purchasing power and so on, we'll uh, have all these worthless uh, gold coins and, and silver coins around. Um, now, if we compare this with the increases of the money supply that we have today, each year in the past uh, 10 years, the money supply has been increased, uh, the money supply under direct control of uh, of the monetary authorities, if we take as an approximation one, and one has been increased almost each single year by about 10%. Okay, each single year. The highest increase of the gold supply in the 19th century when we had the gold, uh, great gold discoveries in South uh, Africa, Alaska, and Australia was 5%. Five, one single year. Okay, and now we have 10 years in a row, 10%. So, right, for, in, in hindsight, we cannot really understand what, what the whole problem was, right? What were they complaining about? 2% increases in the money supply in the case of great gold discovery. What's the big deal? Oh, well, but in any case, so this has um, uh, been uh, given cause to think uh, for economists and uh, various uh, very eminent economists have stressed that, at least from a theoretical point of view, <coughs> it is possible to stabilize purchasing power of paper money more than uh, the purchasing power of, an, of a commodity money. Okay, and that's true. It's true. From a theoretical point of view, that's true. Um, but the objections are uh, as follows. Uh, first of all, as we have seen, it does not matter. Okay? Well, we have 2% or 5% increase of the money supply or decrease in the money supply does not really matter for the economy. Okay, so it's not a big deal. Second, uh, this theoretical possibility of stabilizing the purchasing power of paper money was never applied in practice. Right? In historical fact, it has this whole enterprise of introducing paper money for the sake of stabilizing the purchasing power has been an abject failure right? in all countries. And we had uh, 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 exactly the opposite effect. Throughout the world, we've created a great uh, number of hyperinflations, uh, situations in which the uh, purchasing power decreases so rapidly that people finally uh, stop using the money at all. Uh, the number of hyperinflations increased dramatically. We had uh, up to now about 22 hyperinflations okay, in the history, no recorded history, 22 hyperinflations. All of them, except for three, have taken place in the 20th century. Okay, As a result, and of course, it's only possible to have this with the paper money. The three that did not take place in the 20th century took place in the 18th century, each of them also with the paper money. It's only <coughs> possible from a technical, technical point of view, possible with the paper money, because only paper money can be increased uh, so rapidly as to uh, cause this rapid uh, increase of the price level. Then, um, uh, we have uh, the final argument according to uh, well, the final argument that I consider, um, well, there are two, there are two left. First of all is um, we can uh, use political intervention, particularly under the form of the paper money, to uh, finance the economy better than it could otherwise have been financed. Okay, so in particular we can use the money supply to decrease the interest rate. funds, the demand and the supply, and the central bank then can simply increase the supply of loanable funds, and we see as a consequence the interest rate decreases, okay? We produce money, paper money for example, injected into the credit market, can be a financial market or a banking market, whatever, and since the greater supply is available, for the same demand, the interest rate increases. Okay, wow, that's great. 
we give a great injection into the to the motor, into the economic body, and it works much much better. And clearly, this would not be possible with the, the commodity money. It's not a matter of will. Right? It's a matter, as we have seen, of profitability, determined by the objective environment of the firm. Here, it's really just a matter of the will of the monetary authorities. They can, by and large, increase the monetary, uh, money supply as they wish, thereby decreasing the price level. Okay. Now, of course, that's completely wrong. Right? <laughs> it's wrong. <coughs> the essence of Keynesianism is wrong because it does not reckon with the demand side. Demand is taken to be, uh, market participants are taken to be some sort of rabbits, uh, stones, inanimated objects, cannot think, cannot react. Uh, they just behave as before and, uh, and, and are happy. In particular, they do not anticipate that the purchasing power of money will decrease. Okay? They don't do this, they're just stupid. Okay. Now, uh, if they're not stupid, what will happen? Well, they will simply increase demand, and we see uh, if the demand reacts, anticipating uh, the greater uh, price level that will exist in the future, uh, it can effectively neutralize uh, the, uh, the action of the, of the monetary authorities. The interest rates uh, remain at the level where they were before. It is even possible that the opposite will take place, right? If demand overreacts, they overestimate the decrease of the purchasing power, demand will increase too much, and as a consequence, the interest rate might even increase. Okay, so this is also possible. <coughs> now, if a pol policy can lead to one result, but also to its opposite, and you don't know whether it will lead to the one or the opposite, it doesn't seem to be a very rational policy. Okay, it does not seem to be very smart. You can jump out of the window and you can either break your neck or fly with the help of angels down. <laughs> okay, that's possible. Okay, it doesn't seem to be very smart, it's a very rational policy, right? Can happen, might not. But now let's assume it does actually happen. So the central bank does outsmart the other market participants and they actually do decrease the interest rate. The question still is, is this a good thing? And as the Austrian business cycle theory has shown that's not necessarily a good thing. Okay? Because we have to distinguish between investment projects begun and investment projects completed. Two different pairs of shoes. What the decrease of the interest rate does, the political decrease of the interest rate, is to incite more investments. So a greater number of investment projects take place. But that not, does not mean that we can finish all these investment projects. Our ability to finish them depends on the available real resources, non-monetary resources, that are available in society. They have not increased. Okay? The, yesterday we were at dinner and we brought up already this biblical example that we find and then also Professor Garrison uses in his good lectures on the ocean business cycle theory. So let's say we have this huge heap of, of bricks, and with the help of the bricks we can produce three nice houses. Oh, oh uh, the last one, not quite nice. <laughs> They're all German houses, as you can see, they're, they're very beautiful. And, 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 uh, slight inclination in the roofs and so on. Uh, some of you might think it's, it's ugly, but it's, it's subtle. <laughs> okay, so this is the number of houses that we can build with the bricks. But the problem is, of course, this is a general equilibrium consideration. We are omnisign. We know how many bricks are in here. But this, this heap is enormous. It's huge. We don't actually know how much is in Okay. So maybe what happens if we start building four houses? We can certainly lay the foundations for four houses. No big deal. Right? We can do this. We can start four investment projects. And we can build them up. And maybe when we've reached this stage, we suddenly realize, well, there are not enough bricks left. You see, that's precisely the problem. That's exactly the problem that we have from a macroeconomic point of view also uh, in the economy of the Federal Reserve artificially decreases the interest rate. We come to situations in which we realize well, we don't have the, the resources available to finish all these projects. 
And then, of course, what do we do? Well, we start scrambling, right? The interest rate goes up. And translated into our example, this means, well, we break down some of the projects that we've already begun, right? We, we break this house and use the bricks in the other three. But by breaking the house, of course, we destroy some of the bricks, right? They are imperfect, imperfectly convertible. So as a consequence, we won't even finish a third house. So finally, then we will only have two houses <coughs> finished. That's not good, right? So we see that this policy uh, leads to exactly the opposite of what it was intended to, to do, namely, rather than decreasing um, macroeconomic performance, it decreases it. Okay, uh, so these were just examples uh, you see that the general points of Austrians, in light of all these uh, considerations, which I do not fully develop in my book, I, I refer to the existing literature, which is pretty, pretty exhaustive on, on these points. Uh, the Austrian point of view is, well, that political intervention, the political meddling with the money supply just does not deliver the goods. Okay? Just does not attain the goals that uh, are promised to be attained. And as a consequence, we reaffirm uh, uh, reaffirm uh, our previous thesis, namely that the natural production of money not only works, but it's also the best available type of uh, money production. It cannot be improved through political intervention. Now, in distinction to this um, um, uh, natural production of money, we have deflation, uh, but not, uh, inflation. And inflation is then defined as that increase of the money supply that comes through political intervention. It comes through, let's say more generally, violations of property rights. So for example, if I fake banknotes, I increase the money supply through a violation of property rights, through a fraud. Uh, if I prevent other people from um, becoming uh, money producers, Right, as a monopolist, but I restrain property rights, therefore my own production is greater than it would otherwise have been, and so on. Why do we have inflation? Well, one possibility would be, well, because it's a good thing. That's the thesis of uh, most monetary economists today, who believe that monetary policy works. Right? And inflation would be, under this definition, inflation would be a good, good thing. Austrians do not believe this, so for Austrians there's only one reason left, and that's what is called uh, somewhat coyly, the fiscal reason. Okay, the fact is that inflation brings about a redistributive effect. The production of money benefits the first users of the new money units at the expense of the last users. The first users can pay with, with, with their with their money uh, at a price level that is still relatively low. And exactly as the money now spreads throughout the economy, all prices will increase. Which means that the last persons who receive uh, the new money supply, the new units, that have their nominal income increased, but they had already, for some time before, they had to pay higher prices. So with the same nominal income, they had to pay higher prices, so their real income was decreased. Right? So money production always entails this redistribution. <coughs> and, well, guess what? The government happens to be always among those first in line. Okay. That's not changed. At the time, in the Middle Ages, the government ran the, uh, the houses where money coins were, were stamped. Today, uh, the federal government is, uh, well, not directly in the, the first line, but what happens is uh, that the Federal Reserve, uh, how does the Federal Reserve inject uh, new money into the economy? Well, by, especially by open market policies. That is, it buys and sells short-term uh, assets, short-term financial titles. And in this way, it refinances uh, finances the banks and, and other uh, financial institutions, which then finance the government, okay, by government bonds. So the government is necessarily on the uh, uh, third in line after the banks, so the banks profit most, but then directly comes the government, okay, and then everybody else. Finally, some of the money supply also ends up in New Orleans. We are happy. <laughs> now, um, let me very briefly uh, point out some, uh, well, the, the three main consequences that follow from the presence of a, of a paper money. 
Um, so paper money is uh, always a, a political um, construction. It can only exist, as I've pointed out, because it benefits from uh, the support of government, in particular in the form of legal tender laws. Legal tender laws uh, oblige us to accept Federal Reserve notes, even if we contract our our debt in other means of payment. For example, you can sell your car against 1,000 euros, and then the debtor can, can come and say, well, I'll pay you in euros, I'll pay you in dollars. You're obliged to accept. Okay? So this, of course, effectively undermines the competition between monies. Now, if we have paper money, we can increase the money supply as, as we like. Right? There's no technological limitation. In the case of gold and silver mining, that is a very costly affair. In the case of uh, uh, paper, we just need a drop of more ink. Okay, and we get another zero. <laughs> okay, or the same thing. Maybe we take a little larger paper, or we take smaller numbers, and we can add quite a few more zeros. Okay, and that's not, not a joke. That's what happened in all countries that have very high inflation. They finally ended up with bills that had this look. In Turkey right now, they, uh, uh, they do the equivalent of this. They say 100, 100 million dollars. They just put in uh, an end before it. Okay, that's another possibility. You just leave a little ink, a little inventiveness, <laughs> and then you get it. So it's not costly at all. Okay, what follows from it? Well, first of all, um, uh, there's now a great incentive for debts to increase. Right? Because the uh, Federal Reserve can finance any venture at virtually zero cost. So it can always keep the interest rate relatively low, much lower than uh, the returns that are required from equity investors. Um, as a consequence, then, we have a very uh, strong explosion of, of debts, both public and private, since the introduction of paper money. Paper money we have since 1971, roughly speaking. Since 1971, the money supply has increased U.S. dollars by a factor of six, okay, six times the increase of the total money supply. Federal debt has increased by the factor of 40. That's not possible if you have a commodity money. It's only possible if you have a paper money. Why is this? Well, because the, the, um, the creditors know that the U.S. government will be able to repair any debt, as long as it has the loyalty of its central bank. And of course, it has the loyalty of its central bank. Right? So because people know this, they are willing to give ever greater credits to the U.S. government, even if the actual revenue and the actual uh, wealth of the government does not justify such, such credit. Further consequence is we have uh, fragility of the financial markets. Right? If you have just players who are heavily in debt, uh, then there is the, the great risk that you have a snowball effect if one of them goes bankrupt. Uh, his liabilities are the assets of other people, so if he goes bankrupt, well, other people will have their assets uh, melt down and they will be bankrupt too, and so on and so on. So a very fragile situation which we presently are. And it follows third from it that there's a strong incentive for the government to regulate the economy. That is to uh, impose by law a different behavior than that which it incites on the other hand through its monetary policy. Monetary policy pushes people to indebt themselves. Now comes the law and says, well, you, you may not indebt yourself. Right? If you have to be decent and so on. So as a consequence, we have a twofold movement. On the one hand, explosion of the money supply, explosion of debts. On the one hand, we go into a situation of ever greater regulation and finally socialization, totalitarianism of the economy. Okay, I'll stop here in order to give you a few minutes for questions. <laughs> Where to start? Um, have you ever heard of uh, uh, Emperor, the Emperor Norton incident in San Francisco? Who? Uh, it's a very strange. It basically involved the fact that there was a, an extraordinarily insane individual in San Francisco who thought he was a sovereign emperor. And 
and at one point he began to uh, print his own money, and it was during the uh, gold rush era, and somehow or another people began using it as opposed to the federal money. But it was, it was I think it was a very short term incident. You might want to look at it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, various uh, things of the civil have sort of taken place. In most cases, it was not an independent uh, paper money, but um, uh, I think given an implicit claim, an implicit linkage with an exi already existing money. So I'm sure that in this case, we'll find too that this uh, emperor had uh, uh, issued uh, his money in relation to the US dollar. He said, well, for example, my emperor, one emperor is about one dollar. Such things have taken place. So if you give by, if you insinuate to the users that they can convert this, exchange this at will against an already existing money, and of course you overcome the problem that we mentioned, when we identifying the initial purchasing power. But these uh, promises can often be fraudulent. Right? We don't, don't have any free market for this. These were, these were the three in the 18th century. No. Yeah. You know, yep. to, to what extent do you think that the um, rise of the Nazi party is attributable to the hyperinflation in Germany of 1923. Yeah, that was a very strong causal effect. That's by and large acknowledged by everybody today, even by historians who can sometimes be quite ignorant of economic uh, thoughts. The hyperinflation in 1923 wiped out the German middle class. Okay, so these people were very desperate, were very upset with, uh, and skeptical of democracy and so on. And they were the ones when t things turned bad again at the beginning of the 1930s and immediately switched to uh, more radical political parties. So the situation that we had in 1932 was the uh, uh, exponential growth rates in voters for both extreme ends, right? It's today, not generally known, the communists, and so the international socialists and the national socialists, and well, also uh, Hitler won by a small margin, and so we had a brown socialist. Well, I'll convince you all. Yes, another questions. question. Yeah, okay. Good. I just am curious about a practical con concern. You know, you said that you know without paper money, you have uh, no uh, electronic interaction. This just seems that that's such an important facilitator of financial interactions today, electronically. That you know, wouldn't it greatly reduce yeah, trade yeah. over? Yeah, that's a good question. That, that's not electronic money. Okay, that's the electronic way of dealing with money that is not being produced electronically. You have like warehouses of stuff. Yeah, I mean, you, you, buy, you can have your bank and you can access your bank account electronically. Of course, you can use credit cards and all these things. Uh, the question is, what, what kind of money uh, is, the, is underlying all of this? And with paper money, you get very different consequences than when it's a commodity money. When is your book going to be published? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, 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 somebody told me that uh, she was confident that it would be out uh, this year, which I take to mean it will probably be next year. <laughs> <laughs> so <coughs> I'm desperate. But I'm blocking myself because uh, Professor Bob mentioned that there was this other book, now the, the young man introduced me. There was, this other book was forthcoming, and in fact, it's the other book that is blocking now my money book. Because this needs to be published first. And the facilities are limited as so scarcity. Carol's on scarcity. It always gets across our projects. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your attention.